This is the pastor, Brother Herb, and I am excited to bring you another small group Bible study. We are studying the book of Acts verse by verse, and the theme that we're studying is the Holy Spirit in the church today. The Holy Spirit in the church today. And I want to pick up where I left off last time in the book of Acts chapter 2, and I want to begin to read in verse 37. This is after Simon Peter has preached his great sermon on the day of Pentecost. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse, that means twisted, generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and with many wonders and signs that were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as any one had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple... And breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I want to just bring to your attention today from these scriptures the marks of a true New Testament church. The marks of of a true New Testament church. The first mark is conversion. A New Testament church is to be made up of people who are truly saved, who have been converted. That first of all involves hearing a clear presentation of the gospel. This entire message that Paul has been preaching in Acts chapter 2 has been a gospel message. He started at the birth of Christ, life of Christ, death of Christ, burial, resurrection of Christ, his exaltation to the right hand of the Father, and he preached the, the full gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and impressed on them even before he began the sermon that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, before he could even give the invitation because the gospel is the power of God into salvation, the scripture says the people, before they can even begin to sing, just as I am without one plea, the people began to cry out, and they began to say, what shall we do? The Scripture says they were cut to the heart. That's Holy Spirit conviction. If you have a loved one who's not saved, and you're wondering how to pray for them, pray they fall under conviction. And conviction, gets, it's under, under the skin, into the heart. It can be an irritating experience. Uh, it can be uncomfortable. Many times you've got to get real uncomfortable before you are comforted by the gospel. So they're cut to the heart because he said you people crucified Jesus Christ and our sins crucified Jesus Christ. So having preached the gospel, they're convicted by the Spirit. They have the hearing of faith and they personally receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior the Bible says in verse 41, they that gladly received his word were baptized. So being saved is receiving Jesus Christ into your heart as your personal Savior. They didn't do it grudgingly or because of manipulation. The Bible specifically says they did it gladly. When somebody's under Holy Spirit conviction, you don't have to put any pressure on them. Spirit of God moves in their soul and heart, and brings them to the cross. Personal reception. Second thing I notice about 
true conversion that brings people in the church is it involves public confession. The Bible says in verse 41, they were baptized. Now, right now, it's a difficult time because those who are getting saved, um, you know, we're not able to have our usual baptismal services. And I've been encouraging anybody that's received Christ as their Savior during this crazy uh, time of the virus, a pandemic, that they make sure on the first Sunday back in church, they publicly confess their faith and follow the Lord in believers' baptism. Now, these people didn't get baptized to get saved. They, 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 they got saved and then they were baptized. Uh, they didn't get baptized to some way wash their sins away with water. Only the blood of Jesus can wash your sins away. Baptism is our confession of faith. And the church, a true church, is made up of true believers, people who have received Christ, who have followed the Lord in believers' baptism by immersion. Now, there's only one mode of baptism in the Bible. We see it repeatedly in the book of Acts. First, we see it in the life of our Lord Jesus. Before that, in the life of John the Baptist, who was baptizing by people by immersion in the River Jordan. Then our Lord Jesus was baptized. His, his disciples were baptized. And now the believers are following the Lord in baptism because baptism is like a wedding ring. And it's a picture of the gospel. Pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's our confession of faith. So when people are baptized, they're confessing that with their heart, they've received Christ and his gospel, his death, burial, and resurrection. They have true faith in Christ, and they're letting the world know it. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father who is in heaven. All through Scripture, we see that we're to publicly confess the Lord. You remember when Moses went up on a mountain? That golden calf uh, was built down below. He comes down from the mountain, having been meeting with God, getting the Ten Commandments, and the people are dancing around a golden calf. And Moses stood there, full of the wrath of God. And he said, he went over and stood, and he said, Let everyone who is on the Lord's side come over here and stand with me. Come and make a public confession of your faith. And even in the book of Revelation, chapter 12 and verse 11, it says they overcame the wicked one, the devil, by the word of their testimony. Personal reception. A church is made up. True conversion involves a public confession. And it also involves a powerful experience. When you have true salvation in Jesus Christ, as I preach Sunday, you have experienced the power of his resurrection. Look again what it says in verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. This is the way God builds his church. God added these people to the church. These people weren't manipulated into coming into the church. They were born again into the family of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and it says in verse 12 and verse 13 that we've all been baptized by the Holy Spirit of God into the body of Christ. So a true church is marked by conversion. It is an assembly of people who heard the gospel, personally received it, confessed it with their mouth, and now give evidence that they're a part of the body of Christ. And the day you get saved, you're a part of the family of God. And being a part of family activities and family worship and family Bible study and discipleship ought to be a priority. Here's the second mark of a true church, a true New Testament church, and that is discipleship. Now, I want to say every true disciple of Jesus Christ is a born-again Christian. But not every born-again Christian that I've met along the way is a true disciple of Jesus Christ. The word disciple means to be a learner or to be a follower. I believe to be a disciple of Christ is to be both. It's to be a learner and it's to be a follower. In fact, I believe it means one more thing. It means to be an imitator of. So we are a, a learner of Christ. We're a follower of Christ. And we're an imitator of Christ. Someone has said a student learns what his teacher knows. But a disciple 
becomes what his master is. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We see discipleship taking place from the very moment these people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. True discipleship involves these elements. First of all, Bible study. The Bible says in verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's the Word of God. That's the New Testament. They continued steadfastly, regularly, in personal Bible study. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We overcome the flesh with the Word. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, Your Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. We repel the attacks of Satan with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is what the Holy Spirit uses to sanctify you. And sanctification is the ongoing process whereby the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and molds and makes your character, your conduct, your conversation, and the way you think into the very likeness of Jesus Christ. Man, this is a lifelong process. We are sanctified, it says in Ephesians 5, by the washing of water by the Word of God. So there's got to be Bible study. That's what we're doing right here. When we open up for the business of God and we can come to this place, you need to be in a small group Bible study because that's where discipleship takes place. You need to be in the Word on a daily basis. And right now, one of the things that strengthened me, I want to tell you, it's, it's stiffened my backbone and, and, and strengthened my faith and kept my vision clear has been me constantly as an individual per, Christian going back to the Word, going back to the Word, going back to the Word. And the Word just, man, it just keeps building up your faith. Bible study. Second element of true discipleship is fellowship. Now, verse 42 says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. Now, this is the simplest, best definition I've ever heard of fellowship. Someone said, what is fellowship? Somebody else said, it's two fellows in the same ship. That's a good definition of fellowship. That's the togetherness of the body of Christ. It's being a part of a, of a local church. It's, it, it's being a part of the family life of a local church. It's being a part of the body life of a local church. God never designed the Christian faith to be lived independent of the local church. We're very, very much a people that are family. He said, when you pray, pray our Father who art in heaven. You see, because we're a part of the family of God. So we find these people, they're studying, they're fellowshipping together. And this is one of the ways that God develops us as disciples. Because if you're going to fellowship with each other like these people did, and there were all kinds of people in this church, I mean all kinds of people, First of all, you got to receive people as they are. I mean, the good and the bad and the ugly. And they just may have a personality, and they just may have certain things about them. You don't like it. you got to receive people who they are. And you got to understand God's working on people, and he's not finished with them yet. And, and you're not supposed to press them into your mold. The Bible says you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The, the second thing you got to do if you're going to fellowship is you got to yield your personal rights. Hello? It's not all about me. You'll never be able to maintain fellowship with a diverse crowd of people unless you yield your rights. I mean, you've got to have an attitude, it's not about me and it's all about him. And the third thing you've got to practice is forgiveness. If you're not a good forgiver, you're not going to enjoy good fellowship. So it involves real discipleship, it involves Bible study, it involves fellowship. Thirdly, it involves worship. Verse 42 says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread is the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper was a worship service. It was a time when they remembered his broken body and his shed blood. When we worship, we always look back to the cross before we look up to the throne. Could I say that again? 
We always look back to the cross before we look up to the throne. And then when we worship, after we've looked back to the cross and up to the throne, we should always look forward to the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and pray, even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. The fourth element of discipleship, Bible study, fellowship, worship. The fourth element is prayer. It says at the end of verse 42, they continued steadfastly in prayer. Now, when we pray, we realize God already knows what we're going to ask before we ask it. He already knows what we need before we have the need. And yet God says we're to pray. He says, ask, seek, knock call throughout the scriptures we're encouraged to pray let me tell you what what prayer demonstrates to the father prayer is my confession that i can't handle this and i'm going to depend on god to handle it that's what my prayer is saying to god my prayer is a demonstration that i have faith to believe that everything God's promised in his word, I, I believe the Bible is the inspired, infallible word of God and that God is going to bring it to pass. When I pray, the veil lifts. It's a supernatural experience. Something happens when we pray. And that something that separates the temporary from the eternal, the seen from the unseen, it's like it gets real thin. And we see clearly impossible, invisible things through the lens of Scripture and the eye of faith. That happens in the closet of prayer. So the mark of a true church, conversion. The mark of a true church, discipleship. Mark of a true church, third mark, is holiness. Verse 43 says, then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Those within the church feared God. They feared God. And the way the word fear is used here is to have a reverential awe for God, a respect for God. They were overcome by who God is. So you see these people that came to know Christ as Savior right here in the beginning of their Christian life. They're being taught and they're coming to an understanding that we serve a holy God and He's to be the center of our life. We center all of our hopes and our dreams and our lives on Him. Outside, people feared. You know what they feared? The church was so holy that they thought, we better not attach ourselves to that church until we're really going to get saved because God may strike us dead. That was the holy atmosphere of that local church. Now, we're living in such a secular age. We're living in such a secular time when people are so numb to sin. But when we teach the Word and we receive it, we're sin-sensitive. And what we need in church is a Holy Spirit revival that will bring holiness that is true, not legalistic, but true back to the house of God so that lost people out there tremble at the thought of the holiness of God. And they're going, you know, but I'm not going to just waltz down that aisle and get a little, you know, a little hell insurance. I'm not going to commit myself to be a part of that church until I am serious about truly trusting Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. The fourth mark of a true church is service. God saved us to serve. And notice what the scripture says here. I love this. It says in verse 44, Now all who believed, see that you're saved, not because you get baptized, but because you believe. Now all who believed were together in fellowship. And I love this. It says, And they had all things in common. Now, that's not a verse that teaches communism or socialism. That's a verse that says those who had more gave to those that didn't have much. It says that, that people were, were being used of God to meet needs. Nobody in that early church was going to go hungry. Nobody in that early church was going to go under. Everybody in that early church was working together to see that they made it through the tough times. 
I don't know. Maybe that's one of the things the Lord's trying to teach us through all this. Maybe I'm doing this in a Bible study, but maybe I need to preach this along the way. Think a will. Think a will. You'll be the first to hear it right here when you listen to this on Friday. Maybe God's trying to teach us that as a church, instead of being our little island, living in our little, little, little bubble, just being concerned by our little world, that we need to be together as a church and maybe we need to be actually interested in what everybody else is going through, their hurts, their dilemmas, their pain, their disappointments. The Bible says they had all things in common. And the Scripture says in verse 45, they sold their possessions in good and divided them among all as anyone had need. Giving was involved in that early church. There's a lot of things to give. Giving of our finances, how can a church function without finances? How can we send missionaries without finances? How can we keep the lights burning without finances? How can we carry on ministry without finances? That's not the only gift you give. Brother, smile, kind word, encouragement, sharing truth, using your gift. It's called a gift for a reason because you use it to give back to the body of Christ because God's given you so much. But the early church, they were givers. And, and, and notice the giving... It was sacrificial, and uh, the person who had less gave in proportion to what they had, and the person who had more gave sacrificially in proportion to what they had. So they were giving as an act of worship to the Lord, but also as a way to support local church ministry. And then the fifth and final mark of a true church, New Testament church, is joy. I love this. It says in verse 46, so continuing daily. I mean, they were living out their faith every day. Continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Every time they got together, it wasn't with griping, it was with gladness. And it says in verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being taught and those who were being saved. Joy is something that has to be taught. How did these people learn to respond? These people were going through adversity. How to respond with joy? They were learning it out of the Word of God. How did I learn to respond to pressure with joy? I learned it out of the Word of God. Take that four-chapter book of Philippians. That'll teach you how to respond to life with joy. Joy is also caught. It's taught and it's caught. And people out there, Christians were contagious. Their joy, and joy is, uh, it, it's not happiness. Happiness, is, happiness hinges on happenings. Joy is not controlled by my happenings. Joy is an inner contentment. And a divine happiness I have in my soul that is uncontrolled by my everyday circumstances. And let me close the Bible study on this. You want me to tell you how to have joy? I used to say joy stands for Jesus, others, and you. And that's, that's a good thing, isn't it? J-O-Y, Jesus, others, and you. But one day I was reading and I discovered something better. J-O-Y. J stands for Jesus, the O stands for zero, nothing, the Y stands for you. Joy comes when zero, nothing stands between Jesus and you. We'll pick up next time. Let me pray with you. God, take these words, plant them in the hearts of those listening to me, and I pray this prayer, Lord, in Jesus' holy name, amen. God bless and be safe.